Hi, this is uh, Mike Steckline with the Institute for Enterprise Excellence. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, myself and a group of people, uh, Corrine Bales, uh, Clark Carbonell, and Hal Moran have been working on a paper uh, about performance evaluation and we're asking the question, how is this still a thing? And we wanted to share our current thoughts on the topic via webinar, uh, see if any people were interested in some additional participation in the research that we're doing and have some discussion about some of the latest uh, information that's showing up uh, these days on the internet. The phones are going to be muted uh, but if you have questions you can post them on the question tab on the uh, go to meeting function and um, we'll save some time at the end for questions. Uh, this is being recorded as well so there will be a copy of the recording available for uh, those that want to uh, study it a little bit deeper and uh, perhaps share it with others. So the purpose of this, as I said, is uh, our attempt is to write a paper for the annual International Deming Research Summit. Uh, we had uh, planned to present that uh, this past March. Uh, that meeting was postponed, so we took the opportunity to use a bit of the time uh, to continue to develop the paper. If you're interested, a draft of the paper can be found at that bit.ly link that you'll see on the screen. There's a few topics we're going to go through today and they're listed on the agenda. Uh, we're going to hear uh, some a summary of some of the perspectives uh, Dr. Deming uh, presented on this topic and then the viewpoint of some other leaders and thought, thought and some authors. We also uh, are aware of some companies that have discontinued or fundamentally changed their performance evaluation system, and few, including a few that we talked to during our research. Uh, we'll talk a bit about our team's research methods and then some of the concluding thoughts and uh, trends that we see. And uh, if people are interested in participating, uh, there is a, still an opportunity, certainly, and uh, we'll have a chance for you to participate uh, in the ongoing uh, uh, development of this paper as we proceed. So one of the first items we're going to cover because this was a paper that we're uh, planning on presenting to the Deming uh, Research Summit is um, the work of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. So the first few slides, if people are not familiar with his stance on this, uh, we're going to do a high-level overview of that. And uh, it was his 1986 book that we see shown on this slide here, Out of the Crisis. And he um, used this as an opportunity to articulate not just his 14 points, but also the deadly diseases, as well as obstacles for transformation for Western management. So if you study the 14 principles or points, and there weren't always 14 over time, uh, these evolved, but one of them always got some discussion going on was the question about removing barriers that rob people from pride and workmanship and in particular abolishment of the annual performance evaluation system and annual merit pay. So that's one of the uh, areas that he was um, steadfast in and he's had definitely had some ideas about uh, why this was a barrier to pride and workmanship and joy in work for the front line as well as for managers. If you looked at the seven deadly diseases, and these were uh, pretty significant uh, challenges for Western management, you can see that one of them he also listed here as a uh, deadly disease that afflicts Western management is the use of the annual performance evaluation or the annual review and how challenging uh, that was. And it's also interesting how ubiquitous it is in management and in organizations. And we're finding that it's not only just in Western management, but some um, many co companies in other countries are now applying the uh, performance evaluation as well. And that's one of the trends that we've noticed in some of our research. I like this quote uh, from a, a section of the uh, Out of the Crisis. And um, what's interesting here is people have often used this quote to uh, describe what Dr. Deming saw as far as what was wrong with the prevailing style of management. And actually, um, this is a chapter where he was talking specifically about the performance evaluation system and what specifically is wrong with that. And um, so he said it nourishes the short-term performance, it annihilates long-term planning, builds fear, demolishes teamwork, 
It nourishes rivalry in politics. It leaves people bitter, crushed, bruised, battered, desolate, despondent, dejected, feeling inferior, some even depressed, unfit for work for weeks after receipt of the rating, unable to comprehend why they are inferior. It is unfair as it describes to the people in a group differences that may be caused totally by the system that they work in. Basically what is wrong with performance evaluation or merit rating focuses on the end point on the and at the end of the system, not on leadership to help people. And so he saw it as a way to avoid the problems of people and a manager in essence becomes a manager of defects. In 1993, uh, when Dr. Deming uh, passed away, there's actually two editions of the, this book, The New Economics. The, um, uh, the first edition, uh, he was, was the first time, one of the first time he published and articulated the four parts of a system of profound knowledge from which the, um, the uh, 14 principles came. And then if you uh, uh, look deeper into the book, um, he outlined uh, several arguments as to why uh, the performance evaluation uh, system um, needs to be studied and, if possible, removed from uh, management systems and organizations. So argument number one, I'm going to turn over to Hal and he's going to walk us through a conversation about that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, it, Dr. Deming basically had several arguments uh, against the performance evaluations, and without getting into a, a deep dive, uh, you know, algebra here, we'll spare everyone that problem. Uh, Dr. Deming understood and taught that every system has variation, so it's basically inherent. Uh, you can't escape it, although you can define it, uh, and he had defined that as special cause and common cause variation. So when we look at um, performance evaluations, typically what happens in most organizations is we focus on the individual or the performance of a person. But he's ascribing that in this equation or in this argument is that there's more to productivity or to production or to um, output than just the individual effort. Uh, and, and that has resulted in the equation here of x plus, you know, x times so y equals the result of x. And so basically he's saying it's, it's the person plus those things that you may or may not be able to see, which are known as the parts of the system that go into play in making up uh, the output of any type of a system of which the person is only one part. So to evaluate a person based upon what we feel is their performance, their individual effort, is really a result of what the person is producing inside of a holistic system. And if we take a look at the, the next argument uh, on, on uh, number nine, we'll kind of see that come into play here just a little bit. If we look at a simple uh, system and a complex system, we'll see that when we uh, focus on people or uh, pay for performance, performance evaluation that is mentioned in argument number two here, it tends to suboptimize the system, uh, meaning that when you tinker with one part of the system, such as uh, let's say the carburetor on a car, uh, then you run the risk of messing up um, you know, the, the whole purpose of the car and the smooth running engine to get you where you need to go. And so when we look at a bowling team, it's fairly simple in that you have five members on a bowling team, each person contributes, uh, they roll the ball, uh, you have ten frames, you add your score, you add your score to the other uh, four members and you get a total and the team with the highest total wins. It sounds pretty simple and in that type of a scenario it can work. However, when you look at a complex system like uh, symphony orchestra, uh, you have many parts uh, with um, different instruments playing at different times, different notes, uh, different harmonies and rhythms and melodies, and it doesn't take um, a very keen ear to discern when one instrument might be out of sync, out of tune, might be playing the wrong note, and so it's not just uh, the parts combined to make a whole, but it's the interaction of those parts inside of a symphony orchestra that produce the melodies, the harmonies, and the, rhythm, the, the rhythms that uh, you know, we simply enjoy today. 
Uh, so that's just kind of coming at it uh, from argument number two, the simple versus the complex. And as we see in most systems, they're much more complex than we give them credit for. Thanks, Hal. Appreciate that. Another argument that Dr. Deming made uh, comes from the viewpoint primarily from psychology. So as Hal was outlining the arguments primarily from understanding variation uh, and, uh, and also understanding a system, going back to the four parts of a system of profound knowledge, another argument is from the standpoint of psychology and uh, the uh, understanding that um, people are born high, with high intrinsic motivation at birth, uh, but there's various systems over time that uh, by the use of extrinsic motivation and the dependence upon extrinsic motivation squeezes out uh, that intrinsic motivation uh, over time. So this is a diagram that Dr. Deming uh, used in many of his seminars and it's shown up in the book uh, The New Economics. And I've circled two of those areas related to performance evaluation where he saw uh, these are destructive forces um, dependent upon extrinsic motivation that affect that intrinsic motivation. So again, it's one of, was one of his arguments. Again, uh, why do we have the annual performance evaluation system? Why do we have the merit pay? Why do, ha why do we have pay for performance? And um, he uh, made those arg arguments quite well. Another person that has outlined some of the arguments here, and he really got to be well known uh, for doing this, is Peter Schultes, worked directly with Dr. Deming and um, uh, spent a lot of time trying to explain to people uh, why we needed to um, study and uh, understand why uh, performance evaluation systems as designed um, were doing more harm than good. And so what Peter did was um, elaborated upon that equation of the x uh, plus the x times y and he identified different um, parts that make up an overall rating and uh, labeled those A through F uh, with F being other factors and in um, seminars he would ask people to attribute it. How much do you think uh, of a person's rating can be attributed to these different parts? And that's where the different percentages came up based on what the participants said. And um, the native ability um, is um, number is letter A, individual effort, letter B, and people would attribute quite a bit to the individual effort. Um, yet there were other factors, um, such as the training and education, factor C, um, process variability and capability, the process that affects the person, and then the actual evaluation system and the variability there. And so he was making this argument that uh, the one part that perhaps a person can control, um, factor B, uh, is the only one. Why do we attribute all of it uh, to the to that part? And, and we haven't paid attention to the other parts that are um, in play. Uh, he then had his own four arguments uh, that he listed out here. Some are uh, similar to what Dr. Deming talked about. Some are an elaboration of this. Um, so argument one was uh, the performance evaluations tend to disregard that people work within a team or a group and a lot of times uh, the contributions don't necessarily come from the individuals but the work that a group does together. Um, again, depending upon the system and the processes that you're working on was argument number two. And then uh, argument one, number three, um, that employees work within variability and instability. And this, again, this notion of when we don't understand variation, a lot of the variation comes from the uh, random variation of the processes and the systems, not directly attributed to the individual. And the fourth argument is, is we make strong assumptions that there is no measurement error, that um, any person um, could um, rate another and they would get basically the same rating and we don't understand that there's a lot of um, variability in the raters as well and the rating system. So those were some of his arguments. And then he went on and uh, talked about uh, even if you could address uh, those factors, um, he described what he called the toxic waste of performance evaluation system. Uh, its tendency to produce mediocrity, that um, people will tend to pick easy goals and sure winners if you know that that is how you're going to be paid and how you're going to be rated, uh, you'll tend to pick the easy stuff and uh, 
lend itself toward mediocrity. Again, people may um, not understand capability and um, try to select goals beyond which the process is capable of performing. So no matter what people do, if the system isn't capable of, of achieving those goals, uh, it's not going to do it, and that is another toxic waste. And then Peter was very good in explaining this toxic waste, where he pointed out that a performance evaluation system tends to produce losers and cynics. And most people have a high uh, self uh, thought of themselves and uh, feel that they're probably in the top third of any uh, performance. Uh, and then when they find out that actually uh, they could be below average or just average, um, that could uh, and does have an effect on their self-esteem. Um, so Peter was very good at uh, listing out what are some of these toxic ways that uh, the prevailing performance evaluation system produces and that we need to be careful about. I'm going to turn it over to Clark, and he's going to talk a little bit about another thought leader um, on this topic. Thank you, Mike. Um, Alfie Cohn wrote a book, Punishment uh, by Rewards, in 1993. And uh, Alfie, as a student of Dr. Deming, he really looked at motivation. And this book looks at how society has adopted a pattern of reward and punishment uh, as a form of motivation. Um, he talks about from parenting to educational uh, institutions, to many um, organizations that in which leads into the performance evaluation system that if we reward and punish if we have the right combination that we will uh, motivate folks to uh, for, for performance. Um, there's uh, many uh, fallacies associated with this which are listed here um, you know, as, we, as we've talked about, that they're not as accurate as we'd like them to be, uh, accurate at the extremes. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about that uh, the system produces most of the out, outcomes versus the employee, and that uh, um, with that it's difficult to or impossible to really quantify performance um, it, it tells a lot about the appraiser as it does the appraisee, appraisee. Um, and uh, there's, there's lots of destructive things it does to folks when you're using this particular model. So that's a good book about uh, uh, in, in depth about uh, probably um, the fallacies of the reward and punishment. So. Um, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Clark. Um, I do highly recommend that book. Uh, it's interesting, and it has implications beyond the workforce. It, um, uh, it has implications uh, as far as how we treat children and the education system as well. So it's a very uh, beneficial book to read. Well-researched, to A big chunk of the, of the book actually points to the research that uh, Alfie did. Another book that you can find on this topic uh, is a book written by Tom Collins and Mary Jenkins, uh, several years old, but it, I think it's still valid. And uh, the whole book is about this uh, challenge. And so we went, when we did our research, uh, we could find some of these books and thought leaders that had identified, as we did, some questions about the validity of performance evaluation system. And they do a nice job listing out um, some of the reasons why it doesn't do what it says it does. It actually can um, have some untoward effects. And then they also uh, spend time talking about what to do instead. And that's a part of what our research uh, on other on companies has uh, shown is, is there are some companies that are finding other things. You don't necessarily have the, have to have the traditional performance evaluation system. And um, this is another book, a more recent book, um, an um, animated um, author, Sam Colbert. Um, Google him and you find uh, he's um, written a couple books here. And um, he definitely has a stance on this, and he sees that it's a major problem and uh, points out um, what are the difficulties with it, um, what, what, uh, how uh, prolific um, uh, the um, hatred of the system can be if people are honest about it. 
and um, he's also got some specific uh, points about um, why it continues to exist, which was one of our questions is um, why do we still have the performance evaluation system? And um, I, I recommend this book as well, as well as the other ones we've listed here. And it's one of the later books that we found um, that, this, that describes what are some of the difficulties uh, and challenges with the uh, typical performance evaluation system. I'm going to turn it over to Clark. He's going to talk about another author on the topic, someone else that also worked closely with Dr. Deming. Thank you, Michael. Um, in 1994, Ryan Joyner, um, another collaborator with Dr. Deming, wrote the fourth generation management. Um, you know, Brian talked quite a bit about <clears throat> it's not enough for an organization to improve continuous improvement, but you really need to get faster at doing that. And in his book, he talked about uh, some of the um, things that we try to get out of what we think we're getting out of a performance system. So this, uh, these bullets here reflect, I think, also what we found in our research so that we're looking at a performance evaluation system and, you know, we definitely want, are trying to give feedback to employees, direction to employees, identify any training they may need, uh, trying to promote communication between manager and employee, um, provide evidence of promotion, the, the need for promotion and compensation, and then looking at uh, um, all the legal aspects, if you, uh, you know, associated with promotions and terminations. Um, and we found that, uh, we found all those different ideas when we did our research. Um, he talks about there's uh, uh, no single system that can really do uh, a good job at all these things. Um, uh, it talked about most problems lie in the system versus the individual. That's a common theme with, with all this uh, research. Um, uh, failure to recognize this variation in the perception of performance um, and then fail to recognize the extreme importance of cooperation versus competition between your employees. Uh, as Michael mentioned, this is also a very good book. It, it's uh, back in 1994, but uh, um, still very relevant today. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Um, Hal's going to talk a little bit about some of the discoveries we made of, about companies that have uh, either gotten rid of performance evaluation systems or fundamentally changed them. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, you know, when we look at those companies on the, the slide here, we see Accenture, GE, Deloitte, uh, Microsoft, Adobe, uh, quite prominent and well-known world brands. And, uh, you know, so we might be asking ourselves, gosh, you know, performance evaluations have been entrenched in the marketplace for well over 100 years, a part of our Western mindset of command and control. And so what would force or what would cause some of these organizations and others to begin taking a look at um, how they evaluate uh, their performance management structures? Well, uh, first off, a couple of reasons maybe that come to mind real quickly in doing some research is the competition for workers. Uh, when you know you have a lower unemployment uh, rate uh, in uh, uh, economies uh, where technology is expanding quite rapidly, uh, and you see companies like GE, Accenture, Microsoft, and Adobe as being a part of that uh, those industries, the competition for uh, workers uh, can get pretty fierce and so uh, they're looking at uh, ways in which they can not only attract but also retain those workers and then second is international uh, competition uh, is a cause for change as we complete and more in a global environment and then third is a younger workforce uh, the millennial generation the Gen X millennial and below those primarily under the age of 40 and 45 uh, just, you know, they're not used to the command and control environment and want more flexibility in the workplace and more say in the workplace and how they do their job 
uh, and not just uh, come into work and, and put in their 40 or 50 hours a week and go home. And so as we look at the next slide, um, you know, we see that uh, it's not without um, some consternation that goes involved with that also. So it's not just um, take a performance evaluation and, and throw it out the window, but what do you replace it with? And, and I remember Peter Schulte's once saying, you know, to replace it with nothing is, you know, better than replacing it with just something. Um, and so change is coming, but it's coming, um, albeit slowly, um, and uh, it takes a company like GE, uh, when uh, Jack Welch was there, who had uh, the rank and yank in place for over 30 years, to um, slowly abolish uh, that practice of rank and yank, and then to begin instituting um, with newer type programs, such as 360 reviews, providing feedback on a more frequent basis, making the dialogue uh, more of a two-way street instead of a one-way street. Um, Accenture CEO Pierre uh, Nantrami once said in an interview, the outcome is not great. Instead, the firm will implement a more fluid system of timely feedback based on manager's discretion. So they're uh, kind of the bottom line, they're more fluid, they're more flexible, and what they're moving into uh, is still uh, to be known yet, uh, but they have recognized that judging an employee based upon the performance of the overall system just isn't working. And in fact, it was Deloitte uh, uh, did their own internal audit and they discerned that they, the managers themselves, let alone the employees, but managers are spending two million hours each year just on performance evaluations. So they've opted, at least currently, for our weekly conversations you know, for a feedback not just from the manager to the staff, but also from the staff to the manager. Uh, so those are just some of the results that are coming in. They're coming in slow. These companies have just moved to uh, new types of um, evaluation processes, for lack of a better word, just within about the last one to two years. So uh, that's a small time frame compared to the last, say, 30 to 40 to 50. Thanks, Al. So what we've done so far is talked a bit about the um, theoretical and philosophical arguments against it and also what we've learned as far as some companies that have moved in this direction. And uh, Clark's going to uh, kick us off uh, talking a little bit about some of the work of our research, how we went about it, and what we found. Thank you, Michael. Um, <clears throat> this was really uh, a survey out to 25 different organizations and we had respondents from 41 different folks. Uh, and we're really, you know, we tried to take a crosshatch of the organization. So we had uh, senior leaders, middle management, some frontline staff, folks in quality, human resources, um, uh, respond to this. We had, uh, out of the 25 organizations, we had 23 organizations that, that still have uh, some form of annual performance evaluation system. Only two organizations had discontinued it. Um, there was a, a fair amount of variation, as you can imagine, between how the different organizations were using the performance evaluation system and, and uh, what, they were, what they were getting out of it. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, uh, we had, let's see, some uh, self-evaluation. We had 12 of 39 individuals. Um, we, uh, let's see, what else do we have? So, without going into much detail, we had, we had lots of variation. We asked specific questions, and then... Uh, we got a, a good amount of feedback from that. Now, it wasn't a huge sample size with uh, 25 organizations and 41 individuals, yet I do think our findings were definitely interesting. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Clark. Hal wants to talk a little bit about some of the high-level um, parts of the system that interviewees mentioned. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, and I'll start maybe with just a, a quote from Dr. Deming I've always appreciated, uh, and I think it will tie in here. You might be able to see it in that, that first um, score up there. But Dr. Deming said, if you have a stable system, 
there's no need to specify a goal. You'll get what the system produces. Uh, I think that's interesting in light of this slide and that when uh, Mike calculated and Clark calculated some of these scores, we see that that first component uh, focus on organizational goals, you know, 52% of the respondents, you know, that's the highest rating we have. Um, and then second, what we see after that, 43% um, yet indicate wide variation in applying um, the uh, performance evaluations. So to kind of put that into context, if you know, we were looking at nuts and bolts, our parts for cars, our uh, you know types of healthcare. If we saw that type of a wide variation, we would think that something's wrong with the system. So I think it, you know, or we'd find a lot of errors. And so I think we uh, see that somewhat indicative of, um, you know, people create a performance evaluation system. Uh, there's wide variation in that system, and so when you have something with such wide variation, it's hard to produce consistent results. Uh, and if I was a person being evaluated in a system like that, uh, I think we can see on some of these slides why uh, some people see it, see it as negative. Uh, then uh, the third point, maybe I'll just briefly mention on this slide, uh, is the 35% uh, included a plan for improvement, uh, but for the individual, not the system. Uh, and again, I think there's uh, some telling things there. You can read into that uh, maybe what you'd like to read. Thanks, Al. Um, so here's some of the specific questions that we got into, and Clark's going to talk a little bit about this question um, that you see on the screen. When, when we asked the question, have you tried to get rid of or fundamentally change the performance evaluation system, we had kind of a split, obviously, 11 organizations saying no, they didn't try to change, but 15 organizations have uh, tried to change. Um, some of the reasons associated with that, they thought the process was too arduous and time consuming, they were trying to move away from pay for performance. Um, they didn't want to, uh, no longer wanted to wait or numerically rank their folks. Um, they, uh, the whole concept of the pay for performance or incentive, that, that was an issue with them. Um, uh, let's see, they had uh, um, seven of the organizations have plans in place to change, but yet the majority didn't, so there was this concept that they wanted to change, but there was no, they didn't know what they were going to change to, they didn't have a timeline, but what they did have a sense of that the current system was not meeting expectations and it wasn't what they wanted, but they didn't really have a sense of what, what they did, what was going to be better or a plan to, to move forward. Great, thanks. Um, Hal's going to talk a little bit about this question about what people saw as the purpose for their system. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, it, what's interesting again here, and I think you know we're seeing this on a number of slides, uh, is that the quote unquote other category seems to pop up uh, first or second uh, in, in most of the slides and most of the responses. And again, uh, not to belabor the point, but when we look at that, if we um, looked at the purpose of, say, a piece of machinery uh, uh, or even a car. What's the purpose of a car? I think, generally speaking, we say it's to you know to move product and people from point A to point B. It's the primary you know uh, role or goal of a car, uh, that system. And so we see here that there's a wide range of variety and variation uh, in people's understanding of what they're expecting uh, out of performance evaluations. Uh, and, and so outside of that large category of other, we see a handful of others that I think are fairly significant in that 15% or hey, is to determine pay, you know, their incentive. 15% um, also to, you know, give the staff feedback, not necessarily for the staff to give feedback to, uh, to the manager. And then the simplest rate is to score folks just like we would in, uh, you know, primary, secondary education. 
and then goal alignment, uh, and then some do it uh, if you work in healthcare like I do and have for a number of years. Uh, there's a JACO, NCQA, and uh, TARP, and, and those sorts of accrediting agencies that force it. Um, and then, uh, again, mention the other. There's a whole smattering of reasons, and you can see some of those that uh, that are pulled out, that Mike pulled out on this particular slide. Great. Thanks, Hal. So there's three sub-questions that we ask people about, and Clark's going to lead us through those uh, three sub-questions. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> what we tried to do is really look at if we had a, a culture of quality and some of these elements that we kind of defined as making up a culture, a culture of quality, would we get a sense that the performance evaluation system was actually promoting, uh, pushing that culture of quality? And so uh, one of the questions we asked was that is the performance evaluation system is there, an, is there a positive effect on this aligning to strategy and um, there was a good you know it's a, again it's split but there was a sense that um, the, the, the performance evaluation system was trying to align goals and work around a, the strategy of the organization and again uh, uh, you know there was these were written comments and then we had to code the comments do we think that they're promoting uh, these elements or not and there, there there was a sense that there was an attempt at the performance evaluation system aligning to strategy now when we look at do we have a sense that the performance evaluation system is promoting cooperation between people and departments? Uh, clearly, there was a sense that this, uh, if anything, the performance evaluation system was really uh, kind of pitting people against each other. You know, if if you're going to rank me and I'm in, co I'm, in I'm then in competition. Amongst, amongst my uh, colleague here and uh, if anything there was a sense that definitely it was not promoting cooperation between uh, folks, departments, uh, so clearly there was a sense it was not doing that. Now we also thought that uh, if, um, we, if the system was robust and it was promoting um, a culture of quality then we should ask a question around is it uh, improving performance of work systems and processes and again uh, written comments and uh, there was a pretty much a strong sense that uh, the performance evaluation evaluation system was was not in most cases promoting improvement of work systems So then we asked another question about uh, if systems drive behavior, what behaviors is it driving? And Clark's going to speak a little bit about this slide. And as you can see, um, there's uh, lots of uh, <clears throat> other uh, respondents. The most respondents were in the other, other category. So we have uh, competencies, um, uh, you know that that there's a sense that it's supposed to drive customer satisfaction. Uh, definitely, uh, the behavior supposed to be for getting a pay raise. Um, it definitely uh, looks at silos, so that it's promoting potentially uh, the use of silos, not the system as a whole. Um, another behavior is gaming of the system. Um, you, you if you or you know, uh, if you're going to rate me on my goals, you know, I could game the system and put in a low goal. Uh, Self-promotion, definitely ranking and rating of people, um, and lots of one ofs uh, that you can see on the left there. Um, uh, the second biggest factor w was was compliance. Um, that it that the whole system was to try to get folks, you know, to uh, comply. 
Um, and then uh, again, this concept of goal alignment, that there was a sense that this performance evaluation evaluation system was trying to get goals in alignment. Uh, so in, in summary of this, uh, there's lots of behaviors that the performance evaluation evaluation system is promoting and it's not one or two, there's a there's quite a bit of variation about what it's what you're actually what an organization is actually getting from their performance evaluation system. Thanks, Clark. So one of the questions we asked was, suppose you got rid of this system, what would happen? And Hal is going to speak to what we learned with that question. Well, uh, fortunately, the sky wouldn't fall. <laughs> so, you know, as, as we look here, uh, the results are uh, indicative of the research that uh, Mike and, and Clark and myself have been discussing, uh, as we're seeing from the likes of Dr. Demi and Alfie Cohn and others, in that the primary focus is on people. Uh, and besides the quote-unquote other category, the nothing will change response uh, is the highest as you can see here. And, and I think it's you know it's important to point out that um, you know we're creatures of habit, and so when I see that uh, just a handful of responses here, and I know the, they're small, but when I read uh, that top outlier of those who develop staff would continue to meet periodically to give input, uh, it, it warms my heart to some degree to say that those true leaders, those true uh, managers of people um, are going to step up and step in and say, hey, I still um, have staff who need to be, be developed. I still need to make sure I'm leading, I'm communicating, I'm receiving feedback. Uh, so that we can work together uh, internally to accomplish what we need to accomplish uh, versus, you know, some who would say, hey, you know, um, I have, you know, unclear goals, uh, as if a performance evaluation is the only way to communicate uh, your goals. Uh, no structured interaction. Um, some, you know, indicate on here, well, you know, gee, how am I going to get paid? How am I going to receive a reward? Uh, so, um, creatures of habit uh, is one thing, um, but also, um, you know, we see uh, again here that um, some folks are going to be left in the dark if, if not told what to do at least once a year. Thanks, Hal. So uh, we asked this question, so why do you think it persists? And uh, Clark's going to talk a little bit about what we learned with that question. Is this, uh, let me make sure I'm on the right, is this the chi-square? No, you're not on chi square yet. You're talking about why the system persists. Why the system persists. Um, uh, let's see. We have 13 others, again, uh, 12. Uh, clearly, the rating of, of employees, um, and uh, with that rating of employees really comes the, the, the pay aspect of that, so that the uh, um, I can't see the majority of it because you can see the majority of 13. It talks a lot about uh, uh, it saves money, uh, recognizes people for accomplishment, helps people to see where they need to improve. So there's lots of one one odds there, but one of the large pieces of this, in addition to that, is uh, pay. Uh, I know my organization. That's the the biggest reason why uh, that system persists. Um, the, the part of the culture uh, with that, the, you know, kind of an inherited uh, uh, system that's been around for a while and it's kind of ingrained into the culture. Um, the one about required by regulus, regulation, that was interesting that, that that came up but not really clear about the regulatory bodies about, um, you know, there might be uh, uh, issues with competency with Joint Commission and things, but, but clearly saying that that system is a, a, a mandatory is, is kind of false. I mean, it, it says, talks about competencies, but how to do it is, is not, it definitely not to say we have to do it this way. So there are multiple reasons why it still exists. Thanks, Clark. 
Uh, we asked two questions about uh, the emotional impact of a performance evaluation. One is on if you've been the recipient and one is on the provider. And uh, Hal is going to talk us through these two slides. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, you know, when looking at these, um, the two slides here and the data that's provided, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I ask myself the question, you know, if there might be some quote unquote jury nullification that might go on here to a certain degree and that, you know, people will tell you what you want to hear. Uh, we know that happens in the workplace. And so, you know, when we look here, we see that, um, you know, 14 of the respondents are about, oh, maybe 40% of that pie, um, you know, say, you know, uh, positive and appreciate the feedback. Uh, however, still, uh, the larger percentage of that pie, you know, indicates non-value added, uh, staff are frustrated. There's still a bunch of the others on there, it's awkward, um, you know, hey, it's an initial feel-good experience. Uh, and I guess that's if you're a, you know, been rated highly. Um, some, you know, sense it as a, a, some relief. Um, some are unprepared, meaning, um, you know, it's the first time they've been hearing, you know, of these concerns maybe that a manager might have, quote unquote, regarding their performance. And then others um, feel simply nervous about it. Uh, so results not totally unexpected, um, but yet, um, uh, you know, they are what they are. And then as we look at the next one, it's on uh, folks who have been the provider of performance reviews. Uh, and again, uh, other uh, outweighs, uh, you know, slightly uh, those who uh, felt comfortable, uh, anxious about it. And <clears throat> I think what's uh, <coughs> excuse me, telling there is if a manager or supervisor or leader is uncomfortable or anxious in the preparing and giving of the performance evaluation, uh, you can for sure understand how someone on the receiving end uh, might receive it as well. Uh, and then uh, there was an indication uh, that uh, of six of the uh, folks who responded that it wasn't the first time issues were discussed. And I think that is one positive at least in that, um, you know, you don't save up scraps of paper, post-it notes for one time of year and then hammer somebody over the head with it where if you do have a dialogue on going throughout the year, at least it provides uh, some understanding and clarity uh, before this annual event. Some will uh, simply see it as a feel good, you know, if the evaluation is positive and a feel bad if, you know, again, they were rated on uh, the below, below the norm. And then some saw it as a developmental focus, um, you know, meaning that it's a time for uh, those uh, folks, uh, those managers and supervisors provide feedback um, to their staff in ways in which either they quote unquote can improve their performance or areas that they need to develop uh, maybe in their education, knowledge, or technical, technical aspects and doing their job in order to help uh, the organization achieve their goals. Thanks, Hal. So Clark did a bit of analysis when he, when he looked at the various participants in the uh, survey and he's going to walk us through what he learned about that. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> so as a summary for the chi-square test, um, when you look at the purpose of the test, it was really to determine if there was a clear statistical significant difference between the five various uh, staff functions in the organization regarding the annual performance system and as you recall our the levels that we talked to were executive management and HR middle management there was some quality professionals and then some frontline staff um, now as we mentioned as researchers you know we're in by the teachings of Dr. Deming and it was reasoned that through hypothesis testing that we would have a clear statistical difference that could be uh, demonstrated between these different staff functions and you know specifically we thought since executive management and HR you know since they implemented and govern the current system it was predicted that they would realize more value than would say middle management or the quality professionals and the frontline staff however the test results did not prove that hypothesis um, you know, there, there were some respondents that showed 
a portion as expected, but overall there was what I'm calling this cross-hatched effect, which was evident that some executives and human and some human resource folks clearly had an opposition to the performance appraisal system. And uh, furthermore, there was a portion of middle management middle managers that were in favor of the system. Um, you know, none of the quality professionals were fans of the system. And uh, the survey attempted to answer the question, does the annual employee performance rating and ranking system promote this culture of quality? And as we mentioned, the four elements, strategy alignment, staff cooperation, process improvement, and uh, customer satisfaction behaviors. Um, you know, and what we did, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, the questions were asked about the four elements, and then uh, the respondents were uh, interpreted by the researchers, and they were coded, you know, yes, it promoted, or no, it didn't. And the, the results were blinded, and, uh, you know, 38 folks were included, and, um, and ultimately, uh, you can see the p-values there um, that there was definitely surprise that there were some executives opposed to the annual performance rating and ranking so there was no uh, clear statistical you know the folks at the bottom, the folk, middle managers, middle management, for example, didn't clearly say that they didn't like it, but yet I think what comes out of this is across the breadth of the organization, there are folks that uh, are opposed to and they don't see the value of the annual performance system regardless of where they fit in the organizational hierarchy. So that was some learning that came out of this, different than what we went into it, but yet uh, significant findings. Um, thank you. Thanks, Clark. Very helpful. I appreciate you taking the time to put that together. We, um, we've been making some conclusions, and um, this paper is still in the process of writing, and today's um, presentation was an opportunity for us to share our current thoughts with folks. and. If we had to distill it down into one slide, we came up with this using a quote from Benjamin Franklin uh, as to the question, how is it still a thing? Um, the answer is thinking about Ben Franklin's quote, all mankind divided into three classes, those that are immovable, those that are movable, and then those that move. And we did find some that have moved. Uh, we found two organizations that we talked to that no longer have the traditional performance evaluation system. One of them has developed a system of uh, regular feedback and conversation, and the other one was in the process of designing such a system. And we also have examples um, that we found uh, in the internet and other sources about other companies that have done it, so the movers. And we found that um, the reasons people moved in that direction could be because of the philosophical rationale, could be because of just the imp impracticalities of sustaining the prevailing system. They found it wasteful and destructive. And then also the idea that others have moved, uh, we can move too. And of course a lot of forces still keeping people in place and not um, willing yet to move. And um, none of these things move easily. And as we've seen in some of the recent uh, information that we found that we're going to be sharing, um, it's, um, there's always pushback. As people want to move forward, there's others that are going to say, but wait a minute, it still does a lot of good things. So uh, there's some information just in that we wanted to share uh, from the Wharton School of Business. Uh, two researchers have um, published something, and we have um, a bit.ly link here that you can find out about it. Um, and they did research on um, performance evaluation systems, this um, idea that uh, if you have uh, a system that can identify good people, and uh, good people are always going to be uh, good performers, and the poor performers are going to be poor performers, um, you would have something that showed high reliability around 100%. Uh, when they asked human resources people um, how high they thought that uh, predictor was, they guessed around 80%. In their research, they found that the answer was closer to 27%.
a lot of different factors um, affect the performance and uh, the results. And so that is the interesting uh, recent research that we found. And you can find it too uh, by going to that bit.ly link. Um, just the other day, someone pointed this out to me uh, that showed why eliminating performance evaluation actually caused a drop in performance. And so there's two bit.ly links that you can refer to here. And this is not a surprise given the um, the findings that we had in our, our research. People were concerned about, well, if we stop doing this, how would uh, we make sure that people were getting feedback and talking to each other? Um, uh, yet there were some um, uh, belief that um, if you got rid of the performance evaluation, uh, the performance would decrease. And it goes back to, did the performance come to the, from the individual? Did it come from the system? Did it come from the individual system interaction? And um, Hal, you and Clark were talking a little bit about another Harvard Business Review article that um, you forwarded that we want to include in the, the information that goes out to folks. Um, do you guys want to share a little bit about that while we have a minute or so? You know, it was, um, it just, I just got it today, and it's really looking at uh, um, Dr. how some of Dr. Deming's theories have been kind of forgotten, yet that's really um, with the, uh, all the things that are happening in, in the society now that we really need to revisit his teachings. And, uh, you know, Don Berwick, uh, uh, had chimed in about the value of um, it, of his teachings, and it's a very short, uh, very short article. It was a Harvest Biz, uh, Business Review, um, and I think we we could probably send the link out to folks, and that it's. I think that I think that they would definitely find value in it. We'll certainly do that, and so we'll make sure that it gets there. So if we had to summarize it all, there's a lot of arguments against the performance evaluation system. You think of a teeter-totter um, and a lot of um, people that are moving away from it or companies that are at least um, fundamentally changing the system. But it seems that that prevailing style of management and those beliefs are really strong and really heavy. And the teeter-totter seems to be moving a little. Uh, that's why we made a little bit of space between the, the platform and the, uh, the ground. Um, but we are making progress. So if you have questions or if you want to participate with the next step with our research, here's our contact information. Uh, and uh, we're interested in talking with others um, that are interested in this, those that have tried to change, those that have, have, have made changes in the performance evaluation system. And we're very interested in, um, in helping to move this forward. It looks like we're out of time. I haven't seen any questions come out of the um, question session. Um, Nicole, do you know if there's been any questions that have come forward? Not that I see here. Okay. Well, um, on behalf of my uh, co-presenters and co-writers, uh, Hal Moran and um, Car Carbonell, I want to thank you for um, your time today. Uh, a copy of this recording is going to be available um, on for those that have participated in those uh, in the Healthcare Value Network uh, that are interested in this topic, there is a Human Resources Advisory Committee or Advisory uh, Council that uh, would find this of interest, I think. So, Nicole, thank you too for your time, and um, you can um, close us out for today, and uh, we appreciate everyone's time today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.